Intelligence Investor was published over 60 years ago. Do you still think it's relevant for professional investors today? I think there's no question about it. And there are a couple of principles that Ben Graham talked about that book that really are probably going to be eternally useful. The two for me that are the most important is first is thinking about uh, the idea of Mr. Market, this metaphor. And the fact is that markets are often efficient, but they do periodically veer to inefficiency. And as long as there are humans and human emotions, I suspect that'll be the case. The second is this really core principle of margin of safety, is making sure you buy securities that are worth well less than what their value is. And uh, those, that, those two principles, I think, are, are uh, ongoing lessons. But I suppose that's true, but do you think that <laughs> value investing has become harder today than in Bain Graham's day? Today, investment time horizons have narrowed, or perhaps do you think it's easier today because we have better access to information and there's also greater scope perhaps for things like shareholder activism? Uh, investing in general, like a lot of other activities in life, I think has become much more competitive. There's much more information, many smart people trying to do this. I think probably one of the commonalities uh, about value investing or why things become value stocks is the fact that we work with human emotions and periodically humans become either very euphoric or quite despondent. So as long as those emotions don't get flushed from the markets, I think we'll continue to have those opportunities. So it's always good advice to buy things for less than what they're worth. My suspicion is as long as there are humans and human emotions, we'll have some opportunity for value investing. Do you think there's room though for a combination of both value and growth styles in an investment process? And perhaps this is the trick to know when to, to tilt the portfolio away from one style and towards another, depending on the economic and market cycles. You know, Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's partner, Berkshire Hathaway, says that all intelligent investing is value investing to the, in the sense that you would just buy something for less than what's, what it's worth. And Buffett himself has talked a lot about the fact that value and growth are really joined at the hip. So the principle that we really should operate with is buying things for less than the present value of future cash, cash flows. Often low expectations is a good proxy, a good way to do that, but there can be times when businesses are growing nicely, um, in fact the valuations may not look statistically cheap, but indeed it is a good value. So it's a combination of those two things. The, the key principle though that's, that ties it all together is buying things for uh, low expectations, uh, present value, future cash flows. So there's, there's been a, a lot of academic research conducted and, and published uh, looking into whether fundamental analysis of financial reports, accounting information, can still generate value for investors. Do you th where do you stand on that? Yeah, my, my, my basic take is uh, investing at its very core is finding gaps between fundamentals and expectations. So expectations themselves, when they're very low, um, as long as the ex fundamentals come in better than people think, uh, it's going to be a good investment opportunity. I do think financials can continue to be uh, a very good way to do that. Um, again, many of these topics become less about accounting or financial analysis per se, and much more about being able to manage with behavioral issues. Uh, one of your recent papers looked at the importance of operating leverage and how that's linked to value premium. What, what triggered your interest in looking at operating leverage? Well, the basic fact is many analysts have lots of errors in their forecasts and especially on the downside. So I was very keen to understand precisely uh, how that relationship held up across different sectors, for instance. And in fact, many people talk about the importance of sales growth. The sales growth, though, really must be refined to understand the impact on profitability. So we really wanted to create a very systematic approach to understand from sales to profits, what are the key tri triggers and drivers to try to get a little bit more specificity. One of the things we see a lot in the financial community is a t trend to, to extrapolate uh, what's happening before will come next. And we try to add a little bit of nuance to that type of an analysis. You're a strong believer that investors should focus on expected value in portfolio construction. Can you explain expected value and what proportion of the investment world do you think works in that way? So expected value is the basic concept that there are a range of possible outcomes for a business, for instance, with attached probability. So it's really the probability times the outcome, the sum of those different things give you an expected value. And in fact, by the way, I think the concept of margin of safety should also be tied to the notion of expected value. So the idea is to buy something for well worth and what the expected value looks like. 
But I, there are a couple things about it I really like. One is that it forces you to think about possible outcomes. And second is it forces you to reckon with the fact that everything in the world is probabilistic, including the world of investing. So it, it changes your mindset a little bit, creates a little bit more flexibility in thinking about the world, but again, continues to have the notion of margin of safety as its core. 